All right, I want to welcome everybody who is joining us for today's Wednesday webinar. This is Scott Clayson, the Director of Marketing here at TimeSolve, and we will be just learning a couple of the newest tips and tricks to get the most out of our software. It is the top of the hour here, one o'clock Eastern time, 12 noon central. I will give us about another 30 seconds or a minute or so before we get started, just to let some of the last stragglers uh, head into the webinar here. So feel free to take a quick opportunity to uh, grab that cup of coffee, glass of water, whatever, tea, whatever it takes um, to get through the next 45 minutes or so. So I'll come back on here in, a, in a, about a minute or so. So thanks for hanging, everybody. Okay, we did have a few extra people roll into the meeting here. So um, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Once again, uh, my name is Scott Clayson, Director of Marketing here at TimeSolve, and you're sitting in on our monthly Wednesday webinar. It is the second Wednesday of the month. I want to thank you guys for joining me. I am sitting here in what is now rainy Minneapolis, very overcast, some light thunder. Um, so it's actually kind of a nice, cool summer rain that we have coming in here. So hopefully you guys are having nice weather wherever you happen to be. So uh, a reminder to those who may not have sat in on our Wednesday webinars before, essentially what this monthly uh, session is about is to review the tip of the week email topics that we send out usually every Monday. Uh, you should be getting as the, if you're an administrator, of the TimeSolve account, an email on Monday, our tip of the week, where we'll highlight either new features that are new to TimeSolve that have just been introduced, or features within the software that you may not have uh, known about. You may have learned it during training as you were onboarded to TimeSolve, but you know it's, we all know how it goes. If you don't use it, you lose it, and you may not have recalled that we have uh, features that we like to highlight in the tip of the week. So. That's the basis of these webinars. Generally, we cover four topics to cover the previous four week tip of the week uh, emails. This week, however, we have five uh, tip of the weeks that we're gonna cover. Generally, this should take about 45 minutes uh, at the most, I think, to get through these. We do have um, a chat area where you could post, there's also a Q&A area. I don't really care which spot you, you want to ask questions. I guess I would prefer the question and answer since everybody is on mute. It's easier for me to see those questions there instead of in the chat. Although uh, I could throw a, um, a, a link or some other um, URL that I might need to send you guys. I'll do that through the, through the chat. So. That's it. That's the uh, the heads up here as we get going. So let's take a look at the topics that I want to cover today. Oh, and by the way, when it comes to the questions, I do always say this. Let's wait until maybe the end of each topic that I'm covering before we ask a question. Um, oftentimes, the question you have may be answered by me in the course of reviewing whatever feature I'm, I'm discussing. So let's just wait until after we get through each topic before uh, questions come through. All right, well, without further ado, let's talk about our topics today. A Couple of, um, most of these, in fact, I think all of these actually, are new features that have been released in the TimeSolve application in the last month or so. So we'll work through each one of these and I will show you examples. 
starting with uh, you now have the ability to copy a matter to create a new matter and we'll show you what that entails as far as what you can copy over into a new matter. We know, now have the ability in our reporting area to run accounts receivable reports by different categories. So I'll show you how to set that up if you don't have categories set up and how you would run those reports. Then we also added two new features to our invoice templates. Um, one is the ability to add the actual payment due date to an invoice. So instead of having say like, your, if your payment terms are net 30 or net 15 or net 45 or whatever the case may be, instead of your client having to calculate, well, what exactly does that make my due date of when I have to pay you? Instead, now you can uh, have that actually appear on the invoice. So we'll show you how to do that. Then we also changed just briefly the ability, or I should say not briefly, um, it's a small little thing, but the ability to change a label uh, that appears on the invoice for trust balances. And then speaking of trust, we also have introduced a new way to view trust accounts that you've set to have replenish if they fall below a certain amount. And I'll show you where you can do that under our payments section in TimeSolve. So that is our topics for the day. So let's go ahead and get started. And let me get into TimeSolve account and we'll talk about the ability to copy a matter. This is a really nice feature I think to allow you, if you have matters that are very similar to other matters that you already have set up in TimeSolve with some unique characteristics, whether it's their invoice settings or the payment terms or the invoice narratives, um, whatever the case may be, maybe it's the, the rates that you have set for a particular matter. If you have a new matter that is going to essentially follow a lot of those unique characteristics, instead of having to recreate them in the new matter, now you can just copy that old matter uh, and create a new one. So where you can do that is under our clients and matters. And you would just go to any matter that you have that you know you wanna copy its characteristics. Uh, let's say it's this estate plan matter here. Now, when you're viewing a matter, and you may have noticed this already, in the upper right-hand corner, we now have this new uh, link and icon called Copy Matter. So when we click on it, here's what you have the ability to do. First of all, you need to choose, you already need to have the client that you want to copy the matter to set up. So you should already have that in place. Give it the new name that you want. So in this case, let's say we're going to go and send it over to my client called Aretha. And I'm gonna call this um, estate planning. Now down here, we give you the variety of options in what settings you want to copy over. And as you notice, you have essentially each one of these is the tabs that we have here when you're viewing a matter. So general originators, contacts, invoice settings, so on, follows this, general originators, contacts, invoice settings. Obviously the only tab that you don't have the option of copying anything over is the payment settings. If you are storing a credit card for in a particular matter, obviously for, you're not gonna be able to copy that credit card storage information into a new matter. If you only want to copy specific parts of the matter, then just unselect the all box here and select the boxes that you'd like. Maybe I just want to copy over my originating um, professionals that I have associated with this matter because they also were the originators for this new matter I'm creating, whatever the case may be. Okay, so you can mix and match how much of the existing matter you want to create when you copy over and create a new one. So I'm just gonna hit copy. Now, if I go back under my clients and matters, and I'm gonna delete July here and get to my, here's Aretha and there's the state planning, the new matter that I have here. Notice that it also will copy over the matter budget that I had in place for the old matter. So that's really convenient as well. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, you can have matter plans as templates that you can import into matters. You can also copy it over as you can see here. So this is really handy. I think if you have, if you have matters or projects that 
kind of are all in the same category, whether it's family law or bankruptcy law or whatever the case may be, whatever your practice area is, and each one of those types of um, matters that you practice, the family law, the bankruptcy, all have the same characteristics over and over again. This is a great way to not have to recreate the wheel every time you have a new family law matter or a new bankruptcy matter, whatever the case may be. So that's, uh, I think is a nice convenient uh, thing, save you a little time. And in some ways you could create, I mean, if I were running my time self account, I might create a essentially a master matter that I could almost serve as a template and then copy that when I'm creating new matters, or maybe you have several different templates that you sort of create. So create like a master client, just call it template client, and then create template matter, family law, template matter, bankruptcy, whatever the case may be, apply all the variety of interesting or unique characteristics you want for that type of matter, and then you're ready to copy it when you create the matter for real. So it's a way to sort of have templated matters. Any questions on that feature, copying a matter, before we move on? Okay. All right, next topic then that we want to cover. The ability now with our reporting, specifically our accounts receivable report, to run a report by categories. And essentially now there are three different categories in which you can run an AR report. So let's first talk about, okay, where the, these categories are and how do you set them up? So under your clients and settings, we have a tab here called categories if you haven't used that yet. And essentially we have two categories you can create, customize basically, category one and then essentially a subcategory. And you can give it whatever label you want. I've changed mine. It'll come out of the boxes just saying category and subcategory, I believe. Um, and that may be what it says if you go to into your account now. But you can change that label and create any type of category you'd like. In this case, I was using the example of the type of law that my firm might practice. So I labeled it type of matter, bankruptcy, criminal, family, real estate, and so on. And then I have a subcategory based on maybe you have multiple offices. So it's based on location or the location of your client. Maybe if you do work for clients that are out of state, you want to make sure you categorize them by in state or out of state. It's that simple. And again, you can create as many, um, you know, you can, to your heart's desire, how you want to create categories, but you are limited in creating two categories, a main one and a sub one. So that's categories. We also have, and I've talked about this, I know in a previous webinar, billing categories. And this is specifically for when you are actually running your invoices, you can run invoices by the billing category you've assigned to a matter or a client. And again, you can change the label if you'd like. Some people in other systems, they, it's been called like billing cues, call it whatever you'd like. But then again, create as many different categories as you need. I've done a mix here of, um, clients that I bill perhaps based on in different timelines, like annual billing clients or monthly or quarterly or whatever the case may be. And I've also put in different types of law that I may practice. So now I can mix and match. And when I go to create invoices, I could create, just create every invoice for clients that I've categorized as quarterly billing family law. So then when you have the billing categories set up, how would you apply them to the actual matters, right? So let's go under clients and matters. And we'll go to this estate planning one, this new one that we created. So in the matter itself, over in the general tab, in the right-hand column here, you have the two categories that you created or changed the names for. In this case, remember, I called it type of matter and location. So this is how I could categorize this particular matter. It is a family law in-state location matter. If I have a billing category I want to use because specifically for how I create the invoices for them, I would go to my invoice settings. And this is where you can assign the billing categories and you can assign more than one billing category. So this is, I use that example, family law clients that I do quarterly billing for. This is considered, this estate planning is a family law matter that I bill quarterly. And then I would just hit save. So the billing categories are nice because you can assign more than one. When you're using our stock you know, category, 
you you do can only select one category here. Okay, you can't do multiple categories. So now where this comes into play or can come into play is when it comes to running your AR reports, which of course is probably one of the most popular reports you're, you're gonna wanna run um, in knowing, hey, who the heck owes me money, right? Uh, I will always, and I'd like to remind people again, I love the idea of using our sent invoice screen as essentially a running AR screen. I'm showing all of the sent invoices since the beginning of June. And I can just simply sort them by the balance. So here's everybody who's paid me. Let me click that one more time. It's going to reverse sort it. And it's going to show me the dollar amount of who still owes me money for this batch of invoices. And I could use this then as a way to resend invoices and so on and so forth. However, we do know that many people want to you know, actually create a, an AR report and more importantly, do it by category. So we're going to go into reports here. And previously, you could only run an AR report, I believe, by just the main top level category, not a subcategory and not billing categories. So now I can say, here's my type of matter, here's my location, here's my billing categories. These three categories now are available to filter, <coughs> excuse me, create a filter for running that report. So I could say, show me the family law, you know, in state who have a billing category of quarterly. You could also, you can get much more, much deeper by saying, and these are the responsible professionals. And then you could group the report by the client. You could do it by the type of matter. So you could have all of your family law ones selected, and then you could have your real estate law and so on, then the client, or by the responsible professional and the client. So you can, again, do a lot of different ways in which you can categorize by the way, it's, oh, hopefully you all know that you can include your WIP, your work in progress, and essentially your unbilled time entries. Um, it's really handy now to be able to create filtered accounts receivable reports by the various categories you've assigned to a matter. Questions on that feature that's available now? Okay. I always like to have a long pause, you know, make sure people do get an opportunity to actually type a question. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, let's move on then. Okay, calculating the payment due date to an invoice. So I'm assuming that most of you have set under your client settings, in your invoice settings, You've, sent your, you've set up your payment terms that you use probably the majority of the time. And it comes in, time solve comes out of the box with net 30 selected as the payment terms. Meaning of course that the invoice date in which you, you know, have on the invoice, um, they should be paying you 30 days from the time that you've sent the invoice. However, that involves math. <laughs> and some of your clients, may not necessarily want to determine that if you send out an invoice on August 30th, like, does that mean it's September 12th? Is that 30 days or wait, there's 31 days and is that September 11th that it's due? So we've eliminated that barrier of clients not being able to know exactly when the due date is for your invoice. So let's go over here to invoices and drafts. And I'll show you kind of the difference here. I have a, a number of draft invoices and I'm just gonna select this one and preview it here by clicking on the preview icon. And you notice that it'll have, um, uh, oh, this is a fixed fee invoice. So that's a bad example. Let me see if I can find a better example. Because I have a different template applied to that one. Oh, of course, this isn't gonna, by the way, we are fixing this preview button. Sometimes it does get a little uh, bulky where it doesn't pull up. We do have a bug, a fix for that bug coming soon. Okay, well, let's go this direction here. We're gonna take a look here. Our um, payment terms actually what here was upon receipt. I had changed that. And so let's just go ahead and download a draft here so we can see you know, what it looks like on the actual invoice. And you know, payment terms upon receipt. Okay, so that means it's actually due today, you know, August 12th, right? So 
if we, we can modify our billing template, and remember we can do that right here at the draft invoice level by clicking edit. We can also go to our invoice settings and that's where we can also find our flexible billing template. And I have multiple ones to choose from, obviously, as you can see. But I'm gonna click edit here and pop up the area where I can um, edit my template. And I'm gonna to go to the main page. And this is where you could toggle the box, payment due by, and hit update. Let's see if preview works here on this screen. There it is. So now, not only does it say payment terms upon receipt, but the payment due date. Now, if you don't want both of these to appear, you may have noticed on that same cover page, or excuse me, main page tab, I could, instead of having, or, instead of having both payment terms upon receipt and payment due date, August 12th, if you uncheck this box and hit update, now when that invoice is generated, it's going to say just due date, August 12th, right here. And by the way, this will, um, the date itself, the presentation of the date, 08-12-2020, um, that will run um, based on your default, and hang on just a sec, I gotta remember where you have, it, where we put that. Um, the, under the account, then um, your settings area, you have the a date format and the ability to change that here. And that's, you know, important as well for European countries or, or well, really the rest of the world <laughs> that usually put the date first, then the month, then the year, as opposed to here in the United States where we do month, day, year, and we could do year, month, date. So just a, a quick heads up on that. So that's how you can have your calculated due date. Pretty handy thing um, to have in place. And again, you would just need to update the billing template that's being used to make that happen. And in this case, I use the flexible billing template. I'm gonna go back and set it back to the, the defaults that I had of payment terms. Okay, questions on that, pretty straightforward. Okay, great. Let's then talk about changing the label on the invoice that says trust balance. I think I have an invoice. Yeah, I have this invoice here. Uh, let's see if the preview comes up. I know this, this one has a trust balance. Oh, it's not gonna come up for me. Okay. Let's just download it then. Okay, so on, on this invoice, you see it shows, you know, trust balance of uh, $6,000, $6,010. However, we had many clients who, or many of our customers, I should say, who didn't want to call this trust. They wanted to call it something else, retainer, um, IOLTA maybe. I mean, I don't know, whatever they wanted to call it. And you were limited in, this was the term that was brought up if there was a trust balance to be displayed that you chose to have displayed on an invoice. So again, to modify that, I'm going to go ahead and click on here on the dollar amount. I'm going to edit my flexible billing template. And right down here under the global settings, first of all, if you don't want to include trust accounts or trust balances on your invoices, you don't have to, but by default, those are going to be turned on. Here's now where I can change that label and I could call it retainer balance or whatever I want it to be and I hit update and now obviously the label will appear as you set it. Now it says retainer balance instead of trust balance. So again, just adding some flexibility in the labels that can be um, applied on the invoice itself. Any questions there? I'm gonna change this back to trust. Okay, quiet group today, good. I, well, maybe it's good that there's no questions. It means I'm explaining things well enough, I guess. <laughs> okay, 
let's talk about then our last tip for the uh, webinar here today. And this is the ability to view and replenish trust accounts. So let's back up just a little bit. In fact, I think this matter is a good matter to, to go into and show you. So I'm in matter C here for my July 2020 cohort uh, client. And I have a trust account set up. Now, if you set up a trust account here for each matter, you may remember that you have the ability when you set it up to designate essentially an auto replenishment to be placed on an invoice when the replenishment falls below a certain level and then to replenish it to a certain level. And this will appear on an invoice automatically if you have this set up. You don't have to, but this is a, a really handy thing to essentially get an auto replenish invoice to somebody and not have to generate a, um, a retainer invoice. Now you can actually, under payments, there's a new tab here called replenish. I shouldn't say tab. There's a new navigation link called replenish that is going to show you all of your trust accounts that you have set up to replenish below, when it falls below a certain level and replenish to another level. So if you, it has fallen below, for example, this trust balance is at zero it's fallen below $500, so it should be replenished and they should have received an invoice uh, or in their last invoice, um, you know, that they should re repay it. So now you can come in here and hit replenish when that payment does come in, have the payment method, the, the, the way they paid you the amount and so on, and it'll replenish your trust account right here. Previously, you would have to, you know, you go in and do the old way, which you still can do, go into payments and trust, you know, find the client and matter, you know, let's say it is that it was that, uh, I think it was Medtronic, right? There's the retainer, record, it's a deposit, you know, the type of payment and so on and so forth and record it here. Well, now at least you have a good, easy, visible view of who is behind on their replenishment. And then you just, as the payments come in, you can apply them. This is, you can also, again, if you have a credit card number associated with your matter that you're storing via law pay, which I've shown before, um, it would be available as a um, payment method. I don't think I have any of these. Yeah, credit card on file. So for this training matter one, um, you know, I have a credit card on file. So it, hitting replenish would automatically charge that credit card. Again, a nice easier way for make for having you manage your trust account and especially when you have trust accounts designated to um, be replenished when they fall below a certain amount of money and be replenished up to a certain amount any questions on that okay well that was a fast webinar. We got through all of our topics um, today. So are there any overarching questions that anybody has uh, at this time? Okay. Well, great. Well, if that's the case, then we will go ahead and wrap this up. Um, oh, we do have a question. Is there any way to add two contacts to an invoice, uh, that is a good question. I don't believe so. I'm gonna double check with our support people, but I don't believe so. There is only gonna be one main contact actually on an invoice. Where you could get around that, um, I you know, kind of know, would be perhaps in the invoice narrative. Um, so you could be viewing a uh, invoice here and in the narrative on the cover sheet, let's say, you could put in a second contact. You'd have to manually add that, unfortunately, but you could say, yeah, I want, you know, Scott Clayson and his number is 763 659 or 657, you know, 008, whatever. And then I'm going to hit save. Now, the way that would appear is. 
of course it's not going to preview for me. You just download it again. So here, like it appeared as a second, you know, contact, if you will. So not not an elegant um, way around it, but yeah, I don't believe, and I'm going to double check that. I believe there is only one main to address that can appear on an invoice. When I send out, as you, uh, and again, for those who haven't sat through this before, we, I do record these. I will send a, uh, a link to all of you with the, uh, you can watch this again if need be. I'll put my answer, confirm my answer that I believe it is just only one contact that can be placed on an invoice. Are there any other questions before we head off? Okay, well, everybody, thank you so much for your time. I will send the link when we finish up. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. We will uh, meet again here on September 9th, second Wednesday of September. So take care, everybody. Have a great rest of your week and uh, enjoy your time. Thanks and bye-bye.